our next session, uh, and there's a design to the program, builds on, again, Tavi, thank you for just an, an awesome presentation, um, is going to build on that. You've got a basic sense of how the brain works, and now we're going to talk with three different perspectives about how the addicted brain works um, and link at the end of the panel through uh, Stephen Morse talk uh, about what the linkages are or are not to the criminal justice system. Um, the full bios for each of your presenters are in here, so I won't read them all. I will just um, introduce each one briefly. Dr. Wilson Compton is the Deputy Director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, of the National Institutes of Health uh, in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. NIDA, as I think many, though maybe not all of you know, is the world's leader uh, in funding and supporting and really setting the agenda for addiction research. Um, and to have someone like Dr. Compton, uh, his stature and uh, experience here with us is a real, uh, we're really lucky. Um, and uh, I invite Dr. Compton here and let's welcome him uh, to the stage. Thanks very much. It's certainly a pleasure being here. Uh, I had a delightful day yesterday visiting with uh, faculty from all across OHSU and learning about the phenomenal resources that you have here in Portland that can help guide this discussion around how we can link neuroscience with judicial decision making. You have both some of the leading basic scientists as well as clinical neuroscientists and practitioners to help inform this discussion. So as you look to implement these ideas locally, it's wonderful that you have so many people in the room and so many other resources uh, to rely on. It's really remarkable. Um, and it was a lot of fun, too. It was a scientific show and tell for me, which is <laughs> very unusual. You, you really heard a, a tour de force lecture in the last uh, hour from uh, Dr. Choi. That was really remarkable to take uh, 150 years of history of neuroscience and to condense it into a understandable story that uh, uh, really went from the early days of mapping the brain all the way through the most recent technologies uh, exemplified by Carl Dieseroth's work uh, on clarity. Now, that word clarity actually needs a little, I think a little further explanation. When, when he's saying clarity, they actually take the brain and dissolve all the parts that prevent light from penetrating. So it takes all the fat tissue and removes it and replaces it with a structure. So it keeps the brain structure in three-dimensional space. And that's how the, when those pictures are coming through with all the brain cells, it, most of us have thought about it in terms of you know, doing little, literally, slices and then trying to put it together. He didn't have to slice it up. He's able to look at the connections as is because of that phenomenal engineering of being able to dissolve the uh, structures of the brain that allow that when you normally can't see through it. I mean, we think of these as, you know, you see them and it turned it into something that looks more like jello or very, uh, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud because my agency is one of the early <coughs> funders of Carl's work. There were a number of people who thought he was a little too advanced and didn't believe that he could do what he was going to be successful at. And so we were among the first who supported his research. So whatever he had, success he has, <laughs> the National Institute on Drug Abuse will remind our colleagues <laughs> at other neuroscience institutes who, who supported him first. All right, I digress. And we won't talk about the Cubs versus the Indians. Um, okay, now implicit in a lot of what Dr. Choi presented to you was a sense of the brain sort of, in, in some ways, as a static, adult, fully developed picture. But it's a much more complicated, and I'm going to add one more layer of complexity, at least briefly to you, which is to get a sense of development and how important that is in the onset of both normal brain behavior, as well as for, our, for what I'm going to focus on in terms of the onset of addiction and the risk of developing addiction. So one way to think about this is, you know, we have this old argument, it's sort of nature versus nurture. It's all in our genes. It all depends on who our parents just happen to be or our grandparents, what the genetic risk profile might be. On the other hand, we have people saying, well, it's, it's all a matter of nature. It's all a matter of how our mothers took care of us early in childhood. Well, of course, the story is a complicated interaction of these two levels, at a minimum. Uh, and that's our current thinking about how we understand the onset of many behavioral health conditions, and frankly, a lot of normal behavior as well. That it's a combination of innate temperament, innate genetic factors that might predisposed to certain responses to the environment in combination with 
uh, uh, environment, and at least for infants, environment means mostly the, the, the family environment, the maternal environment in, in particular. And so those responses can make such a huge difference in the developmental trajectories. Now we've learned about this through many ways. When we think about the environment, I, I've highlighted for you one, the early maternal environment. Uh, but we can think about the environment in many different ways that can influence these trajectories that can lead into addiction or into health. We can think about them in terms of the family environment. We can think about them in terms of early adversity. That's a more subtle one. How might early adversity change the brain in a way to prime someone to being at risk for looking at drugs and finding drugs particularly rewarding? That's a key question that we're addressing scientifically, both through observational developmental studies, which show a key association, and now we're beginning to understand how some of the brain development may be modified by early childhood environments to lead to a greater liking of the immediate response you get from drugs, an inability <coughs> of that cartoon on our right or left shoulder, the conscience in the frontal cortex to guide behavior and to uh, uh, overcome the automatic emotional response, the automatic donut urge, as we've heard. I was a little disappointed that there were no donuts. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe later this afternoon. <laughs> All right, so we think about, so the environment includes family environment, external adversity, but I also want you to remember that the environment includes culture, it includes neighborhoods, it includes friendship environments, it includes laws and policies as well. That all of these can interact with biology in complex ways. And certainly that's part of what appeals to me about the studying addiction is that it is, biology is an essential, it's a, neurobiology is a key component, but it's not limited to just the neurobiology. It's in combination with a whole variety of social and developmental factors. Um, to me that makes it exciting to study and to help support research all across the spectrum. We've had the pleasure and the opportunity to understand brain development over the last couple of decades through uh, studies that look at normal brain development using uh, MRI scans. So this is just highlighting for you across age, showing that the brain changes in terms of its uh, linkages and its uh, connections across time. Uh, you heard quite a bit about poor functioning of, or diminished functioning of the frontal lobes of the orbital frontal and prefrontal cortex in Phineas Gage, and that extreme version is also reflected in a more minor way in many of the patients I take care of who have drug abuse and drug addiction. They have a diminished capacity in terms of their ability to make judgments and decision making. Drugs have corrupted that through a long process of, of practice and behavior. But we also know that those processes, those normal brain uh, centers, take time to develop. In the adolescent brain, the emotional parts develop first. So we have an emotional responsivity early in adolescence, but we have the frontal lobes developing and the connections between those, which is really what's essential. It's not just that they sit out there, but there's strong connections between them to exert control. Those develop later. Uh, I am, neuroscience can now teach us a great deal about those trajectories, but I will say that this has been known by uh, uh, many parts of society for, for time immemorial. Uh, just look at uh, uh, the car insurance world. If you go to rent a car, <laughs> how old do you have to be to get a, either to rent it at all or to get a discounted rate? Typically 25. So actuarials have recognized the risk taking and poor judgment in uh, young adults who are otherwise fully capable of doing all the com com complex operations in managing a, a motor vehicle, but their judgment, particularly with other teenagers or other young adults in the vehicle with them, may be impaired. And we can now understand that from the brain connection and neuroscience perspective. So let me give you a couple of examples of gene environment interactions, and then we'll talk some about the addiction phenotype itself. I have sort of three purposes in the next few minutes talk briefly about this gene environment development concept, because I think that's essential when you think about the trajectories that have led into addiction and early childhood environments, and also our ability to implement prevention that can shape these trajectories in much more positive ways. I would also remind us that history is not destiny, that while our best approach may be to create a nurturing, positive, supporting environment to help set uh, 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 humans on a positive growth trajectory, even when that has been absent, 
We can make changes to adults. People can learn and change and adapt at every stage of life. It's just a little more difficult. So it requires greater effort and greater uh, attention to a long-term perspective. Uh, and so I, I, I would suggest that from a policy standpoint, that means we might think about addressing criminal justice with investment in early childhood development. In fact, your neighbors to the north did that recently. Instead of building a prison uh, based on a, a full economic analysis uh, by their legislature, they decided to invest in uh, early childhood prevention. Idea that it takes several years or a decade to really build a prison and get it implemented. And instead they thought, well, it's about the same cost of doing these two things over time. Uh, let's invest in something that can prevent the need for that prison. I thought that was a, it's unusual, that decision making, and so I like to highlight it particularly for neighbors where you all might be able to consider some of the same actions here in Oregon. Okay, this is a landmark study and I was thrilled yesterday to meet Dr. Grant at OHSU um, because she was part of the team that conducted this study. And while I presented this numerous times, I've never actually presented it to the scientists who <laughs> did the study. So, so I count on Dr. Grant to raise her hand and gently correct me if I get some of the details wrong or to clarify something. This is a, 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 an experiment that looked at social stress and, it, uh, and looked at what, what happens to the brains in response to social stress. So it's a primate model using macaque monkeys and the first part of the experiment was to house them in individual cages. That's stressful. Primates, like humans, require social interactions for our, our normal and healthy functioning. So under that stressful situation, they measured the dopamine receptor levels in their midbrains. That's what you're looking at. You're looking down at, this is a variation of some of that neuroimaging that you heard a lot about, but you're looking down at the head. You can picture the eyeballs at the top. What you're seeing uh, in, the, in the center of the brain are the uh, midbrain structures, the limbic structures related to do that have dopamine receptors. They're filled with dopamine receptors and you expect a lot of activities, uh, activity in there. In general, when individually housed, you'll just take me at my word, those are low levels of dopamine receptors imaged. The second part of the experiment was to move them from that individual housing into a group housing, so a social structure. That allowed a social hierarchy to be developed uh, and I just learned today that the way they did this experiment was there were four cages kind of like this that where they were individually housed. They took out the barriers, so suddenly they went from individual individually housed to a group housing. Well, when that happens, they array themselves in a social hierarchy. So what, what does it mean to be dominant in a group of four monkeys? It means you win fights, you eat first, and you get particularly a lot of touch and grooming by the other uh, uh, those who are subordinate remain stressed and don't get those social goodies from the environment. Well, what's to me a landmark project and what the landmark finding is, you change the social setting and they were able to document that the dopamine receptor levels markedly increased. Well, that's uh, pretty astounding that we now have the technology to help us uncover the brain mechanisms of social hierarchy. and and in some ways social dominance, and, and some of the earmarks of that. Well, okay, I'm from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Why did my agency fund this work? Well, we funded it because it's related to propensity to self-administer drugs of abuse. In this case, they studied cocaine self-administration. Those with the increasing dopamine receptor levels were much less likely to self-administer cocaine. So this tells us that in some ways, it's very hopeful for prevention and other, uh, 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 for, for pre prevention research. If we can shift the social environment in ways that strengthen the brain, uh, and in this case, in a, in a, in a measurable way, we can uh, reduce the liking of an important drug of abuse. And if you don't like it, you're not going to self-administer it as much, so you won't have the addiction. Yeah? Could you explain the chart just a little bit more for me? Uh, what you're looking at is the uh, 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 number of times they push on, a, push on a lever to obtain cocaine during a, a, a single session. So I'm not sure how long the sessions were, I suspect an hour or two. And they look at how many times they press on the lever to obtain cocaine. And those that uh, were subordinate were much more likely to work hard. And how many times you push on a lever is an, is a, an estimate of how hard you'll work for a drug. So that's not dissimilar to what many of our offenders or patients do to obtain their drugs of abuse. It's a typical model in the uh, 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 
drug addiction field. We, we have an advantage over many other areas of <coughs> behavioral science in that all, all the, virtually all, not quite all, but most of the drugs of abuse that humans will take, you can get animals to take uh, in a similar overindulgent pattern and then examine well, what, what parts of the brain are operating and we can manipulate that in experimental ways that we certainly can't do with humans. Okay, this is a primate study. A few years later, uh, uh, Diana Martinez and colleagues were finally able to figure out well, what looks sort of the same as social dominance in monkeys and what relates to the dopamine receptor levels. And using PET scans in humans, they were able to determine that social support correlated very, very strongly with dopamine receptors as well. I remember talking to some of the scientists who initially were like, going, well, can't we just use socioeconomic status? And it's like, no. SES, how wealthy you are, we can measure that in exquisite detail, but that's not the same as self-satisfaction. In this case, they found social support was much more correlated. And a simple way to think about it is, you can be poor, but be a leader and get wonderful social goodies in your, in your neighborhood, from your family, from your friends. You can be a leader in your church. You can be a community organizer and yet not earn much money and live in a pretty mediocre neighborhood. So that was too blunt a tool and didn't uh, show any correlation. But social support is strongly uh, uh, correlated, and that might be something we can manipulate. So the next question is, can we use this information to develop interventions? All right, so that's number one for these gene environment interactions, or social environment can be manipulated and we can now measure brain changes. This is an example of a gene environment interaction, and I'll, I'll walk you through this because it's a, a terrific study. This comes out of the strong African-American family study in Georgia. Jean Brody and colleagues are doing a family-based prevention intervention with families in rural Georgia. Uh, and so they're working with middle school kids. And what they do is they work with the uh, families to improve their ability to provide a involved supporting environment. So that means both good supervision and a loving nurturing environment. You know, the, the hallmarks of terrific parenting that is not easy to always provide to a 13-year-old. Uh, so coaching and counseling on that can make a difference. That's the, that's the basis for their intervention study. Well, as part of their project, they did, they uh, collected biological specimens and did uh, genetic, at least some genetics on their study subjects. One of the genes they looked at was a serotonin transporter uh, uh, gene. And, uh, the first question is, is that associated with the drug use outcomes? So what you have in the vertical bar, so the size of these bars showed over the ensuing two or three years after the baseline assessment, so from between sixth grade and about eighth grade, some kids will start using substances. This is reality. Many of them will start drinking, start using marijuana, start smoking cigarettes. So what you can plot is the rate of increase in comparison to different factors. So the blue bars are the high genetic risk based on this serotonin transporter gene, and the pink bars are the, are the less genetic risk. So you can tell that there's a difference just generally between those two groups. But then they subdivided the group into another <coughs> level. They looked at what kind of parenting they got. And the conclusion is very interesting. When you look at the families that are high in support, you know, high in this uh, 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 involved supportive parenting, it didn't matter whether the kids had the genetic risk or not. They really weren't going to use that many substances over the next couple of years. But when you looked at the kids who were at low risk, having a less involved, supportive, loving, nurturing parents didn't make as much difference either. But the high risk kids with a poor family environment were those that were the most likely to, to uh, have this uh, poorer outcome. This is beginning to show us that there's individual variation in risk background that intersects with something very important. Now, we've taken advantage of this in terms of our prevention programming, uh, and here's an example of how this can pay off. There's uh, now three studies that look at how the Strengthening Families 10 to 14 program, which is a middle school after, it's an after school middle, you know, sixth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade intervention. Uh, that uh, it has a few number of sessions that really help parents be better at providing a loving, nurturing environment for their kids. They also teach them about proper supervision. It doesn't focus so directly on drugs. It does some, but mostly it's focusing on general parenting skills. 
So the theory is, and there's now multiple studies to document the effectiveness of intervention, that it provides what I would think of as a protective shield around these youth. That given that family environment, they are somewhat less likely to use drugs over the ensuing years. Now what was amazing is they looked at opioid misuse and general prescription misuse about eight years later in these kids. And those who got that family-based intervention were less likely to take up this potentially lethal habit. That was pretty cool. That's the theory of family bonding, which we saw in the genetic gene environment interaction study, is important in predicting what kids get in trouble. And it turns out we can make a difference. It's not an absolute effect. There are many kids that don't respond to this. I'm showing you some of the clearest findings and not every kid responds, but we now have three studies, randomized, well-designed, randomized clinical trials to document the effectiveness of this approach. Now we'll come to this when I focus at the end on the opioid issues and some treatment, but this tells me that we have approaches that can make a difference. Where's our willpower and our willingness to implement them on a widespread basis? All right, that's number one, focus on development. Now I want to focus with you on the, a little bit more about the neuroscience of addiction. I'm thrilled that Dr. Choi, frankly, did the heavy lifting already here. So one way to think about this is to see addiction as a relapsing chronic disorder, but there is recurrence and there is recovery, both spontaneous recovery in response to some learning in the environment. We see this particularly with those who have substance problems during their late teens and early 20s, when many of them, as they mature and assume adult roles and have probably that brain maturation, will have a, a remission uh, uh, and recovery. Some of us think of it as spontaneously, but it's almost always in response to environmental pressures that help guide that new and healthier decision making. And some of them have the ability to learn. Those that we see in our clinical practice and that you're seeing in reentry courts are a little harder headed. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be thinking about what can we do to uh, 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 shape the environment to increase the probability of their learning and changing and developing positively over time. There's sort of a three-stage cycle that I want to highlight for you. The initial onset involves the pleasure that we heard about, the donut effect, the fact that drugs feel good. And so inherently, something that feels good, we want to do over and over. If it feels good once, I think, well, let's try it again. Um, uh, and when it comes to substances, given the dangers and the potentially <coughs> damaging effects, that can be a life-threatening repeat occurrence. As drug addiction progress, as drug use progresses, we see a, 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 the second stage relating to withdrawal and negative affect. So it's no longer sort of using substances because it feels good, but it's more using them to prevent yourself feeling so bad and trying to avoid the, the discomfort of withdrawal or the discomfort when you're not using. It's not always formal withdrawal like we see with alcohol and opioids, but even the discomfort of being sober for a short period of time motivates more drug use. And finally, the craving and urge, the long-term preoccupation and anticipation stages, the third ma major part of this. So we'll talk about this briefly. As I've highlighted for you, all drugs activate dopamine in the reward centers, or at least I think I've mentioned that. They almost all do. Um, one thing that's important is that this is linked to the environment in important ways. So it's not always the drug itself, but it can be cues about the drugs that trigger this this uh, 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 dopamine system. And you heard about this even in the donut example. You see a picture of one, you get hungry, you want it, and if you don't get it, you actually get craving and urges and you actually feel uncomfortable. Same thing with drugs, drugs of abuse. Part of this is we've learned through some wonderful basic science is that drugs can tr trigger, we, we now understand a little bit about how memory formation happens through triggering gene expression, to strengthen or weaken certain synapses, and beginning to uncover this allows us to move from the sort of global view of how drugs might impact the brain to a, a truly microscopic view of, of how memories form in terms of changes in the neurons themselves. Now, how we link these different levels of neuroscience is a huge challenge for the field, but I think it's important to keep in mind that we are moving forward on a very basic level, as well as sort of the more operational level, how are different brain regions connected, as well as for me, I'm thinking about, well, how do I link this to prevention and treatment? Uh, but I digress just a little. When we think about memory, here's a, a study that I want to highlight for you. This is another classic study 
that used uh, 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 MRI scans, functional MRI to look at, or, or not functional, just uh, MRI scans to look at what parts of the brain showed activation when exposed to cocaine cues. That means pictures of rock cocaine, that means pictures of cocaine powder or a crack pipe. And uh, uh, those that had a history of cocaine use showed activation predictably in, in, in three brain regions in this study. So that was the first part of their study. It's like, oh, okay, we can begin to identify where craving and where urges may be located in the brain. But the study did two parts. It both showed cocaine cues and it showed erotic cues, sexually explicit pictures. And there are two things that are learned from this. One, look at the controls. They showed activation in those same brain regions. So that tells us these are normal brain regions that are usurped by drugs of abuse. As you should respond with some excitement and interest and at least a little titillation when you see <laughs> surprising sexually explicit pictures. Uh, but I think there are two things going on here. One, we see that response in normal subjects. We see the cocaine response in the cocaine users. But look at the response of the cocaine users to the erotic pictures. It's a blunted response. So the clinicians and the treatment world uh, or the intervention world has two challenges how to help our patients respond their, their abnormal, excessive, and dangerous response to cocaine cues, and the diminished response to things that should be pleasurable for them. That's the goal of treatment. Okay, it's a hardwired, fast system. Okay, did you get that? <laughs> if you were a cocaine user, and that was a picture of a crack pipe, you very well could have had urges and craving. That's because the visual cortex is connected so tightly to the limbic system. We need to respond quickly to fearful, dangerous things in the environment. It doesn't need to depend on how quickly it gets to our cortical brain. When you step off a curb and a bus almost hits you and you have le leapt back before you kind of even know what you've done, that's your automatic response system. Drugs of abuse operate in that same automatic fast response system. And that's another way that our patients really struggle uh, because of these issues. All right, so that's number one. I'm gonna go through the next parts more quickly because uh, anyway, I'm just a few more minutes. But. Uh, when we think about withdrawal and negative affect as sort of the second stage, so you're set up to like drugs based on the initial rewarding response forming memory formation, and eventually those condition cues, how the environment becomes part of that process. But as drugs are used over and over, there's diminished, uh, uh, the reward system becomes damaged in some ways and has diminished functioning. So it's like you, you are just pushing the system hard over and over, and so it'll turn itself down uh, over, over time. Uh, so there is a need for greater drugs. It also means that negative emotions and the stress system plays a key role, a role here. We know that when people go through withdrawal, they have an exaggerated uh, a stress hormone response, and those set up the brain for looking for relief from those, so looking for sub substances to uh, improve the automatic response to those stressful settings. The third part that I think I've highlighted for you in some ways already in terms of that uh, uh, automatic response uh, is, and, and that early s description of the frontal lobe development during adolescence, is how important these, the front part of our brains are in terms of judgment and decision making. And as Dr. Choi highlighted for you, substance uh, users, particularly addicts, have a diminished functioning of that frontal lobe. <coughs> So you sort of have a double whammy. You have a substance or a behavior that produces excessive, pleasurable responses, seems to meet some of the needs. We have uh, a, 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 an issue with use of the substances because of withdrawal and stress responses where they begin to make you feel better when you feel miserable. And you also have a diminished connection between the frontal lobes and those uh, deeper structures. So you have a diminished ability to resist temptation and to adjust behavior accordingly. That's what we're dealing with in terms of addressing drug abuse and drug addiction. In some ways, I think that tells us that these are long-term conditions that need a long-term focus because if we're gonna unlearn some of these behaviors, we need to be thinking about the complex ways we can we can shape uh, both the 
behavior and in turn shape the brains and imp improve the brains. I think you've heard about some of these. I want to highlight a couple more examples and then wrap up here. Disruptions in the, the major brain regions of the basal ganglia, that's part of the pleasure reward seeking areas or the amygdala in terms of that's part of the anxiety and the stress <laughs> response later in the cycle or in the frontal cortex in terms of difficulty uh, in, uh, in providing uh, accurate judgment and decision making. Uh, that uh, disruptions in all these brains really enable that response to substances. So this automatic response to those drug cues is because of abnormalities in these brain structures and function. Now one of the key issues here is that the brain changes persist for some time. I actually don't know how long. We have very few studies looking at the long-term outcomes of abstinence and doing proper uh, 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 neuroimaging of those subjects to understand how long it lasts and how long treatment should go on, how long supervision should go on. We know from uh, some clinical work and clinical descriptive studies that there's something about a several year process that looks useful. So I would look at the physician's health programs that typically have a five year time period uh, uh, and have a terrific outcome. Once people have been stable for five years, they seem to do quite well. We also have natural history studies that seem to show that those uh, persons with severe addiction who have remained abstinent for as long as about three years tend to have much better outcomes than those with shorter term abstinence. But it does tell us that there needs to be a long period of time to uh, 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 adapt to a non-drug using lifestyle, to change the social circumstances. So it's not just the drugs of abuse and the brain effects sort of by themselves, but it's in combination with all those external factors that feed into it. I'm going to highlight for you just for a moment a little bit about the prescription opioid and then we'll wrap up because you're going to hear a lot more about this during the day. But what's driven the public attention to the opioids has been this market increase in deaths related to opioids. So we've had an increase in overall opioid deaths. If this were a few years ago, I really would have only talked about prescription opioids. That's the dash line. But in the last four years, we've seen heroin increasing markedly. The number of deaths are staggering. We also have early indications that this is 2014 data, the 2015 data, which will be released, we expect, next month by the CDC. There's no reason to think that it'll be an improvement. Many of the states have issued their 2015 data, and it's not a good story. So we are not winning this battle so far. Uh, how many? That's 47,000 deaths. That's about as many deaths as there were as soldiers in the entire Vietnam War. I struggle with examples to try to bring this to life. Um, it's about the equivalent of two fully loaded 747s crashing every week. That one, seemed, that one seems to work for me. <laughs> it's uh, quite a bit more than the number of uh, motor vehicle accidents, and yet we spend a lot of attention and time to improve road safety. So what can we do about this? Well, we've been addressing it through prevention. The upstream driver is excess prescribing of opioids, so let's focus on that. Life-saving access to naloxone, which is a blocker of the opioid, uh, of opioids, so that can save lives acutely, and also medication-assisted treatment. Now, medication-assisted treatment is what I want to wrap up on because we have not fully availed ourselves of this potentially life-saving treatment. It comes in two forms, both agonists and blockers. Antagonist is a medical way of saying a blocking agent. Agonists are like methadone or buprenorphine, so they replace heroin and opioids. They provide a stable dose of the opioid and have a lot of the same actions. A key factor is that when they're provided adequately and in a full dose, they prevent heroin from binding and exerting its activities. Same with the antagonists. The goal is not to prevent withdrawal, but to have an adequate dose on board that you fully occupy the receptors and don't allow heroin or the, the illicit prescription opioids to exert their effect. So our patients end up with a sore arm, an empty wallet, and no intoxication. If we don't extinguish the behavior by blocking that response, we will not have a successful treatment. And medications can help us with that by changing that learning. Baltimore has showed us that when they increase access to first methadone and then buprenorphine, they saw a reduction in overdose deaths. That's one of the few examples of sort of the population level impact. And I'm, I'm going to just, I, I want to show you just two more slides here. One is, this is the blocking agent, naltrexone. 
that showed much less use of opioids over time in a probation and parole population. They also showed that there were fewer overdoses when this blocking agent was provided. And most recently, we just saw the, the approval of a new medication, a long-acting <coughs> six-month implanted buprenorphine uh, device that was approved just a few months ago by the FDA. It was proven to be equal to the oral buprenorphine. Now, our real question is, how does it compare to, to it, it was only used in patients who were stable on buprenorphine to begin with. So the real qu next question is, well, could we use this a little earlier? A lot of my patients are non-compliant with their daily medication. Instead of making a decision every day of whether I want, you know, you want to remain clean and sober, wouldn't it be nice to only have to make that decision once every six months? Um, but we haven't shown that it's useful <coughs> earlier in treatment, and so those will be some of the next studies that we engage in, I hope. Okay. Not, uh, I, I hope I've done this adequately, but what I've suggested to you is that drug addiction is a brain disease that includes development, uh, that ch is uh, influenced by human growth and human development and normal brain development. It involves reward, memory, and of course, frontal lobe and decision-making control circuits. If I had to pick one, that's probably the most important area, and that's what we will be mostly using to manipulate in treatment, to try to strengthen and enhance those over time. I look forward to discussing with you the implications of, of, of this part of the neuroscience and learning more about treatment and talking about how to solve your local issues throughout the rest of the day. Thanks very much.